Hello everyone, this is going to be an introduction and a departure. A departure, not necessarily from my old channel, but basically everything I talk about in my other channel, Cyberfunkisms, is under duress and constantly being, um, because it's just going an against all, everything that's ever said. So that channel is still going to be my basically philosophy critiquing channel, but now I'm going to also be working on my other channel, which is my solar punkisms channel, the channel where I will be discussing more about spirituality and my expert knowledge in the realm of the things I would be talking about if the world wasn't so terrible. <laughs> so the positive, basically the positive things, but again, as my r cyberfunk on reddit description shows i always believe that the best way to reach towards any type of solar punk is by acknowledging the dystopia to acknowledge the, the dystopia before we can reach towards any type of utopia so here i'm going to be talking about one thing that I got a lot of messages about, which was sleep paralysis. And I got a lot of messages about this because I was so sure of myself uh, with regards to this issue. It just seemed obvious to me, but it seems that a lot of people are suffering from the fear of the nightmare of sleep paralysis. So to begin, dear explorers of the mind, we are going to be talking about today the edges of consciousness and how we must we can navigate through a sea of sleeping into the depths of dreams and i highly recommend waking life the movie it's a good way of introducing these so-called totems and totems is another movie from inception where you can where i also recommend that you watch that movie as well not necessarily for the bah, <laughs> drama but more for what it can teach you about how to get into the lucid phase. There was a time when I also had nightmares, but I also learned to become lucid in my dreams. And my lucidity is so advanced, I think, today, that I don't even need to become lucid anymore. So I will get to that by the end of the video. But in order to reach that point, I guess you do have to practice lucidity. First, let's talk about sleep paralysis. In order to understand sleep paralysis, we need to understand that the stages of sleep itself. Sleep is not a uniform state of unconsciousness, but it's a rather complex symphony of psychological, neurological, and physiological events. It can be divided into various stages depending on how you look at it. So basically light sleep, deep sleep, and REM sleep are the basic ways of to look at it, but there are more complicated explanations of this. M my point isn't to focus on the physiological, but to focus on the more spiritual aspect of this, the Jungian aspect of this, even though on my other channel, I would have a lot of critiques of Jung. Among the stages, REM is the most interesting. It's called the rapid eye movement. It's when your eye starts to move around and you could see someone. And during this sleep, sleep phase, this is the very important phase. You shouldn't wake anybody up in this phase because they are really doing the work of healing, of psychological healing in this moment. In this time, our muscles may become immobilized. It's a natural occurrence and it's designed to uh, have us not acting out during our dream. So we don't punch somebody <laughs> if we're, you know, fighting some monster or something, if we're having a nightmare. But we do obviously have little movements as well. And there's also another kind of little movement stage, and it's the, called the hypnagonic jerk. Uh, those are little movements that we make before we sleep. And that's basically our body checking to see that all of our nerves are working. So it's kind of a system reset. So this is where sleep paralysis comes into play. They're both of these kinds of things are on the edge of consciousness on the edge of wakefulness and sleep. It's a unique state of consciousness, sleep paralysis, when you wake up, but your body hasn't, doesn't know that it's w waking up yet. You're, you remain paralyzed and 
basically your between the dream world and the wakefulness world. Now, this stage can be alarming for a lot of people, but it's temporary and it can be used as a unique signal to prompt you to your lucidity. Now, other forms of prompting you into lucidity, for example, can be the light switch, as you can see in the wake Wakeful Life video in the movie, where somebody flicks the light, light and it doesn't work. Or you can open up a book or try to read something and the words are going to move around. So those are all hints. And another hint that you can do is introduce daily rituals in your life. And ritual is basically my expertise as well. Ritual being the opposite of addiction in my vocabulary. The ritual here that I'm referring to is basically telling people sweet dreams when you say goodbye to them. Because if you're in a dream and, it's, and you've normalized the, high, the idiom, the, a hive mind idiom of your own, uh, to tell people to sweet dreams. So if you're in a dream and you say goodbye to somebody, sweet dreams, oh, there's a light in the, there's a light there. There's a eureka moment. That is a totem, whether it's the light switch, whether it's the book that's moving around or whether it's, and, or there's a bunch of diff different totems that you could create for yourself. Um, in the movie, they say, oh, don't tell anybody your totem or something, but it doesn't, I don't think it really matters. In the sleep phase, you can use that as a moment to realize that you are in a dream. And so, for example, there was a dream that I had where I was being chased by a giant monster. I somehow, I realized I was in a dream and I create manifested myself just growing bigger and bigger and bigger until the monster became very small and I squished it. <laughs> so that's an example of how you can use lucidity to get out of any fearful stage or nightmare that you may have. One time I had a dream where I actually tested a bunch of different, because I'm a very skeptical person. I'm only, I'm even skeptical of myself in the dream, even if I say it's a dream. So I was at a party in Montreal because Montreal is a great place to party. And I was drinking a beer and I said to myself, oh, you know, getting drunk is a lot like being in a dream. And then I look at the beer. I'm like, am I drunk right now? <laughs> I don't think I'm drunk. And then all of a sudden, all the walls started falling up. You know, in Montreal, there's all these brick houses, brick walls everywhere. And so all the br brick walls started slowly coming apart and the whole room was just floating in a void. And I didn't believe that I was in a dream still. So I was kind of in debate with myself. And I asked the person next to me, I said, am I in a dream? And they're like, no, no, you're, you're, you're awake. <laughs> you know, they, they would, the, the dream people would lie to me the projections, the polymorphous projections. And so I didn't believe them or myself. And so I flicked the light and the light wasn't working. Uh, and I said, oh, I need to look at a book. And out of nowhere, a door to my room just opened up and I go into, and even though all this crazy stuff is happening, I still don't believe I'm in a dream. I, a crazy wall, a door opened in front of me. I opened it, there's my library in front and I have a thousand books and I know my library very well. I, I kept trying to look for a, a book with words in it, but I just kept, finding picture books. And I'm like, oh no, I need to manifest here. I need to manifest. So I actually looked at the clock as well. The clock was all wonky. And so I was trying to find a, a book with words in it so I can, but I, I kept opening up picture books. So I'm like, wait a second, if this is a dream, I can manifest a book. <laughs> so I started to manifest and all of my nerves in my brain, it felt like I had pins and needles in my brain. And I'm like, Oh, maybe, and I said to myself, oh, maybe I'm dying. I need to wake up right away. And so I start shaking my head in the, in the dream. And then in reality, I start shaking my head and I woke up. So that was actually one of the real pillar dreams I had where I really learned how to become conscious in my dreams, how to become lucid in my dreams. So instead of perceiving the terrifying occurrence, whatever it may be, whether it's a nightmare, whatever it is, it, whatever the crazy thing it is, you can find your totem. And I'm tell telling you that the sleep paralysis itself is a really, really good totem to realize you're in a dream because, you know, you're definitely in a state of sleep paralysis. It's very easy to recognize at some point if you are conscious of it, if you remind yourself every day, if you, it's a kind of a conscious process, it's a frontal lobe pro process. You can bring your frontal lobe into the, all the stuff that's going on in the back back of the brain, the frontal lobe being the most advanced conscious part of ourselves, perhaps. 
So you can harness the potential of the sleep paralysis as a stepping stone to lucidity in dreams. Because a lot of times in the sleep paralysis, you know, you can't move and there's like a, a burglar or something or something bad is happening. You're in a state of sleep paralysis and you're like, oh, I can't move and the monster is about to kill me. But that's the moment you know that that's you're in a dream because you can't move. How is it possible? You have to ask yourself that question. You have to have a philosophical attitude. You have to have a skeptical questioning attitude towards daily existence. You know, when you say goodbye to somebody, you say sweet dreams. Hey, am I in a dream? You just have to ask the question a couple times because sometimes the projections will try to be like, no, 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 you're, <laughs> this is not a dream. What are you talking about? Even though all this crazy stuff is going on. So, uh, so lucid dreaming, again, the act of, the consciousness of being aware while you are inside your dreams. It, this sleep paralysis can be a totem, it can be a clue, and it's a fascinating gateway into lucid dreaming. I think it's one of the best gateways, actually. I think it's something that we all share, this sleep paralysis stage. So next time you, fight your, you find yourself in a state of sleep paralysis, don't be afraid, don't try to fight it, just relax. Let your consciousness sink back, try to recognize, try to ask some questions like as if you're Descartes. Descartes, uh, his qu question is, you know, what if the world was created uh, by some demon and everything I perceive is just wrong? So be like Descartes, ask yourself, have a philosophical attitude, ask questions and use the sleep paralysis as a launching pad for lucid dreaming. So I hope that this will help some people uh, with their sleep paralysis and not make them afraid but rather excited to have sleep paralysis because a lot of people are burdened by this sleep paralysis and are trying to find information about it and uh, there's not really that much information about this kind of thing that i'm saying right now remember your brain your mind dreams and this is where i'm going to get a little bit spiritual dreams are this access into a collective consciousness Jungian collective consciousness, a God that is being created. God, you know, this, this is my ontotheology that I, I possess. It's a Hegelian ontotheology where we are moving towards building a God, perhaps. And there is this, you know, DMT world where you can, where people call it a temple. And you can go into the temple and you can see the temple is everywhere. The temple is basically the flower of life. And that's basically the more advanced stages. And you can fly through time and space within the your dream world and get to that the temple that is very shared amongst all of us. So now I'm going to talk about advanced lucid dreaming. And advanced lucid dreaming, I during my lucid dreaming phases, I talked to this uh, Native American indigenous guy in Canada. And he told me that, you know, I was telling him how I love to explore, you know, this was when I was really into lucid dreaming. I was like exploring everything, going through time and space, ancient Egypt, like whatever was there. There's just so many possibilities there. And I could speak French or I could, sp I could speak French. Like I have a little bit of French, but I could speak French fluently or I could speak different languages fluently. There's so many things to explore. And Basically, the Native American guy told me that you shouldn't be doing that. Today, I very much agree with him, and I don't try to bring my frontal lobe to try to shape the dream as much as I used to. Honestly, I never really even do it anymore, unless there's no, there's no need for me to do it these days. But to get to that stage, it's very, it's very hard. It's, it's a lot of hard work to get to this advanced stage of lucid dreaming. So now, even though I know I'm dreaming, I let the dream carry me to where it wants me to explore. I don't try to consciously create or manifest anymore. Like in the, in, in my earlier younger days where I was always all oh, like, like I, I, I was excited to go to sleep because I want to like, you know, explore all this stuff, but whatever, you know, you can go fly and do whatever you like in, in a dream. Right. <laughs> so it's really fun. But now I just let my subconscious or unconscious all this, you know, Jungian or psychological terms. I, I'm not a big fan of psychology. Um, I'm, crit I'm writing a book on critiquing psychology right now. All of these ideas, now I just let, now I just sit back and relax. Even though I might, even though it's not like I don't know I'm dreaming or I do know I'm dreaming. Honestly, deep inside, I know. So there's these four categories that you can ask yourself. Uh, you know what you know, the things that you know what you know. I know that I know how to cook an egg. 
I know how to, I know how to I know that I know how to ride a bike. I know that I don't know things that you know that you don't know. I know that I don't know uh, how big the universe is or whether quantum physics or string theory is correct. I don't know that I know. So that's the that's the realm of lucidity that I'm at now, where there's a lot of things that you don't know, but deep inside that you know. You don't consciously know it. You don't know it with your frontal lobe, but deep inside, you know. So now I'm at the next level of lucid dreaming where I turn off my frontal lobe regarding lucidity, but my the I do really know I'm in a dream. I know I'm in a dream, even though, so I, I now nowadays I don't let my basically frontal lobe control everything. And this is very, and then there's the realm where you don't know where you don't know, and that's just, you don't know where you don't know. So that's just, uh, that's the most crazy realm, so maybe. So that's also part of a healing process where, you know, we live in a time where people are reacting to each other all the time. Oh, you said this and that's racist or that's sexist or, you know, like all these, <laughs> all these, uh, well, yeah, sometimes it is, but people react too easily. Uh, uh, you know, on Twitter, I'm on Twitter and now there's 18 year old, like, hey, you know, <laughs> just like reacting to each other all the time. And I'm so, I'm so grateful that I basically, I healed before I, you know, got into the Twitter, Twitter space and started having Twitter debates with <laughs> racists and all these people. So, <laughs> um, what I love is that I was able to basically stop my reactions and that's a, that's a frontal lobe thing. So when you're stopping your reactions, that's a frontal lobe coming into play. So that's kind of the other side of the coin where if you can be lucid in the non-frontal lobe part of your brain, you can also start to heal in terms of historical collective trauma, which is basically the, the main work that I, that I do. Historical collective trauma is something that we are all arising from. Nightmares of history, as James Joyce puts it. And in that situation, when we're dealing with each other in real life, we have to basically distinguish from the traumas that are our own and the traumas that are other people's. And I know myself, I know what traumas are mine. And nowadays, even though I'm very assertive and I'm very aggressive in my argumentation sometimes, it's never a trauma motivated thing anymore. Because some, sometimes someone would say something and it's like a lightning bolt, tush, it triggers you. And people are always doing that. And I, I feel so date scared for all of these, you know, the teenagers on the internet that are growing up in Twitter culture and growing up with this uh, reactionary. And that's what reactionaryism is really. Reactionaryism isn't left or right. Reactionaryism is just this inability to bring your frontal lobe, to take a step back, to take a breath and really examine the situation, see whether you are lucid in real life. Once you become lucid in dreams, you can also become lucid in real life. You can basically distinguish the lucidity and your traumas from lucidity and traumas of other people. So thank you for taking uh, this journey with me today. And I hope that my conversation about sleep paralysis was helpful for you. So if you're interested in philosophical critique, join my cyberfunkism channel. And if you want more spirituality work and positivity and all this CBT stuff that I'm critical on my cyberfunkism channel, but I think is very useful in my Solar Punkisms channel. <laughs> uh, come in to my Solar Punk Isms channel. Isms, isms on both. Thank you. Om Namaste. Grazie.